friends, have I gotten your attention yet? What do you think of the uh, antenna and my own special wings? Well, I am here to talk to you about monarch butterflies. Let's look at the insect in question. This is in fact a male. He's got one spot there. He's actually got another one over here, but he didn't see fit to show us that one this time. Anyway, this is what we're talking about. We don't see tigers, we don't see elephants. We're not in India, we're not in Africa. But here in the Midwest Flyway, the monarchs fly through. They want to lay their eggs here. They want to have their babies here. And you and I, we want to help them. So let's see what we can do. All right, some statistics. Number of monarchs in 1996. Ooh, one billion. That's a very big number. Number in 2013, oh, 33 million. That's not so many, and they need our help before they become endangered. Now, I don't know if you understand how our monarchs that we see in the summer here in Illinois have come from Mexico and are flying back to the Midwest, and then they go on to Canada. Oh my gosh, then they reverse the trip. What is wrong with these bugs? Whatever. Another statistic, they fly miles flown by monarchs from wintering grounds in Mexico to the United States and Canada, 3,000 miles they fly. Wow, think about that. Okay, I think I've got your attention. My name is Kay McNeil and I am on the board of Garden Clubs of Illinois. Now, my actual title is Bee, Bird and Butterfly Chairman uh, I'm always a little afraid they're going to add bats to that type of title, but so far, so good. And now that we're discussing bats, which we aren't really, I will add 3,000 insects a night. I know a lot of you are saying, I don't want to know anything about bats. Oh, yes, you do. That's all you need to know, 3,000 insects a night. Moving back to monarchs. Okay, we can do something to help monarchs. And what is it? All a monarch butterfly wants is a milkweed plant. And we can grow those here. They are perennial. They will come back for you every year. Don't you love something besides a petunia that you don't have to pay for every year? Sure you do. And there are many kinds which are not invasive. So I'm going, I think I've got your attention now with my cute antenna, my adorable wings, and I think you're going to keep watching this video because I'm going to tell you a lot more stuff about monarchs. As part of my thing of being on the board of garden, oh, butterfly moment. As part of my thing of being on the Garden Clubs of Illinois, uh, of course, I'm supposed to promote butterflies, et cetera, et cetera. So our Garden Clubs of Illinois president at one board meeting said, you know, we've got some money in the President's Project Fund. How about if all you people come up with ideas? I called her that afternoon. I said, I think gardeners all over the state of Illinois want to help bring back monarchs. And I said, Carol, let's help monarchs. I said, this is something that all garden clubs can do. Everybody, no matter what age, can participate. And I think this is great. She talked to the rest of the board. Yes, they were in. Well, as you know, if it's your idea, what? You're the chairman. So here I am, chairman for Garden Clubs of Illinois, Milkweed for Monarchs program. Now, let's look at some things we can do with, swamp, with uh, common milkweed and can create fields of this. Monarchs want big fields of milkweed. Oh, did you see that? Did you see those monarchs? Is it past my nose? Well, th this is all part of the fun. I have a garden filled, and we are in my garden. I have a garden filled with butterflies, and isn't this wonderful? Anyway, what a bunch of little uh, fussy movie stars coming by. Let's move on and look at some common milkweed. I am out in the field behind my yard and I am very fortunate that this has been left uncut. And you may probably can see behind me all of these wonderful common milkweed plants which are huge. And this is one of the things you're going to want to look for when you're looking for seed is to find some roadside or a field that has a lot of that. Remember, always ask permission. You may find some prairie people who will have extra seed, but you want to find seed. Now, do we all understand that monarch butterflies, 
only lay their eggs on milkweed. You put monarch caterpillars in with grass, they would rather drop dead than eat that junk. No, they only want their milkweed. We don't know why. I don't even think humans ever eat milkweed. Anyway, this is what a big field should look like. You can spot this kind of a look from the road and know that there is a big stand of milkweed. Now, I'm going to show you some close-ups of what the flowers look like and the start of the pods, the seed pods look like. Now, this is a flower. We call this an umbel, U-M-B-E-L. And you'll see some milkweed beetles on here. There are like four different kinds of beetles that will eat four different parts of this plant, which is sort of interesting. But isn't this the best flower? And I wish I could tell you about the fragrance. Coming out in this field when this is all in full bloom, it just knocks your socks off. But this is common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. Oh my gosh, and look who we have here. Hi. Look at this guy. Oh my gosh, he's so fat. Have you been having a good time eating your milkweed? Can we see him? Okay, here we see the caterpillar. Loving his milkweed. This guy is so big, he's about ready to go into chrysalis. I'll tell you something about the chrysalis. It's under the striped skin. I don't know what that means. Think about it. This is quite the creature. Another thing that is really interesting about this plant now, as you can see, some of these flowers are getting to be at the end of their life, and they will turn into pods because they've been pollinated. But look at this. Here is where we see the pods. And these are what you're going to look for, but it'll be twice as big as this by fall. At some point, it will crack open and you'll see all this fluff. If you are opening this pod at the correct time, you will be able to hold the fluff in your finger and strip off the seeds. Hmm, think about it. But this is what we want, the seeds out of these pods. I'll tell you a little story too. This is such a fascinating plant. An interesting thing about the milkweed is that in World War II, they used to fill Navy life preservers with kapok and from the kapok tree in the Philippines. But that was impossible to get. So what to do? Somebody discovered that milkweed plants, the fluff from milkweed, is water resistant. Oh, what a great filler for Navy life vests. But how were they going to get uh, somebody to collect fluff from milkweed plants? Well, somebody must have noticed that Illinois used to have a lot of it along the roadsides before we had so many genetically modified fields. And they decided they would try filling the life preservers with milkweed fluff. Okay, so they sent out onion bags to the kids in the one-room schoolhouses around Illinois. If you go online and look at these stories, they are so adorable. One, one teacher wrote, well, I've only got 12 kids in my school, and they're pretty small for their age, but we collected 50 pounds of milkweed fluff. Uh, stories like that. So adorable, so cute. Anyway, I had one lady come up to me and say, oh, when I was a kid, I had to collect fluff uh, for life preservers. And I said, were you in a one-room schoolhouse? She said, how would you know that? Hey, the monarch lady knows stuff. Now here's a nice stand of common milkweed, and you probably can see behind me a lot of plants that look like this rubber tree plant. Common milkweed. Now, Used to be, Illinois was covered with this stuff all along roadsides. I've had so many farm kids that tell me, oh, their father made them pull this stuff because if the cow ate it, it made the milk taste bad. I asked a horse lady, she says the horses are too smart, smarter than cows, and they spit it out. Anyway, if you go out south of Chicagoland right now, you'll see that all the fields are perfect. They're soybean fields that got, do not have a single weed in them. And why is that? Because that's all genetically modified and sprayed with Roundup. Makes a big difference in seeing this roadside stuff. So we need more areas like this. And if I say so myself, I did this with my own little bunch of pods. They're under the leaves, you know. 
Oh, nice orange ladybug. But this is how you want your field to look. Lots of milkweed. Look, I've got one of the other milkweed beetles for you. Oh, don't fly away. And he came out of, well, we know the technical word, umble. There he went. Woohoo. Okay, monarch friends. Now I'm going to teach you how to become the mother of a caterpillar. And you are now thinking to yourself, what can that possibly mean and why would I do that? Well, the reason that you are going to bring in monarch caterpillars and raise them in swell big pretzel kegs on your kitchen table is because if you leave the caterpillars out in nature, there's a whole bunch of stuff that wants to eat them. Spiders, wasps, birds. Now, scientists tell us that birds don't eat monarch caterpillars because they taste bad. Ooh, but they all had to try the first one, now didn't they? So, you have a 90% chance of raising and releasing a successful adult monarch butterfly if you bring it inside and raise it out. The percentages of what happens if you leave it out in nature, and I have people who say, oh no, I'm, I think we should leave it out there and let nature take its course. Ooh, it will disappear. I, I first got started in the caterpillar raising business because I would get the kids home from school, I'd get the husband home from work, I'd get everybody lined up so they could see my beautiful caterpillar I'd found that day. Oh, he's gone. So, now we bring him in and you're going to have a lot more success doing this. You're also going to want to send for my information sheet called How to Be a Mother to a Caterpillar. You probably see that going along. All right, let's look at some guys and here you see my big jars. I have these all up and down my table in the summertime. Uh, makes it for interesting eating. A lot of people buy terrariums. I have a friend who has a deal. She only buys terrariums at garage sales. They are less than $3. So you work out your own little thing and what you want to put your caterpillars in. But what you want to do for sure is have... Um, I'm going to uh, take my guys out now. You are going to love this. Your friends will find caterpillars in their yard. They will bring you the little leaf. What you want to do is make sure you always have lots of nice milkweed in here. And remember, monarchs only eat milkweed. If you put grass or some other plant in here you think is a milkweed and they don't eat it, ooh, you've had a clue. All right, what I've done is taken these out of the big pretzel containers and this one, I have a whole bunch of little guys, and we're going to show you a close-up of a little teeny, teeny, weeny one. But don't forget, when the egg hatches, that caterpillar is only as big as a comma on a printed page. So uh, to tell the truth, I really like to leave the little ones out till they get a little bit bigger. Then I feel comfortable bringing them inside and uh, working with them. Now. This is what you don't want to have happen. This shows you caterpillars on flout with a flower tube and it's 11 o'clock at night. Oh, and sud suddenly you realize your caterpillars are out of food. What to do? Well, you're gonna put on your forehead flashlight and go out and find some darn milkweed and move them onto it. All right, now in here, whoops. There he is underneath there again. Okay, we've got lots of guys. And what you want to do is when you're bringing them fresh food, you want to be sure you clean the frass out from underneath the, uh, in the pretzel container. Now you see, this has been pretty well eaten. And this is a flower test tube. You know that you got roses. Hopefully someone sent you roses and they had these on the bottom and you saved them because this works great. You want to be sure that you put the milkweed in water and you want to be sure that you either have it covered with a lid like this or with double tin foil because, oh, what a surprise. Monarch caterpillars are a little bit stupid. So they will keep climbing down the food and will go into the water and drown. And we would feel very bad about that. Okay, let's look at our next little glass here and look at some chrysalis. Now, this is what the chrysalis looks like up close. 
And apparently this gold business and the gold spots on the bottom, those are for air exchange. Now we wanted to show you also some close-ups of the chrysalis. Do you see the gold line and the gold spots? This is really a stunning thing. And the first day, you can start to see the wings through the chrysalis. This is just the thinnest of membranes. And then it'll turn black the day before. And out he comes. And one thing that happens after your, your butterfly is going to turn black, the next morning he will have hatched, and you're going to have to wait, because remember, he is coming out of this little green thing, and there's a lot to unfold. So he will spend a good part of the morning plumping up his wings and uh, moving the fluid out of his central body and into his wings so he's ready to be released. You'll know that he's ready to go out into the big world and you are ready to be a proud monarch mother. So that's when you take them outside. You put your arm down in your big pretzel container. They will climb up. Sometimes they linger, check out the world. Other times they just fly off and get on with their monarch business. Okay, here is, oh look, two little ones both together. Are we seeing this? And this little teeny weeny guy, that's why I don't like to bring the little ones in because if your uh, milkweeds slump uh, or start to curl up a little bit, you have a harder time keeping track of him. You feel a little nervous moving him around. Isn't he cute? But I couldn't resist bringing him in, even though he's awfully tiny. They can get, oh, we got a small guy here too, but we've got a big guy. Ah, wakey, wakey. Come on, boys. Whole jar of big guys. Before they go into the chrysalis, they're going to hang in a J. And I don't know if this guy is getting ready to make a J, but he's an unusual color. He's getting just a little brownish. So uh, hard to say exactly what's going to happen here, but he's awfully fat. So these guys are about ready to do their chrysalis thing, I would say. Now we have a couple little movies for you that will show you how this caterpillar, chrysalis, butterfly stuff really works. Here you see the stripy skin of the caterpillar is splitting. And you'll notice he's hooked up by his little foot up there. He's been hanging in a J for a day, and then all of a sudden he starts cracking his skin like this. And the thing is, the chrysalis is inside that stripy skin. How does that happen? I have no idea. I am not a science girl here by a long shot. All right, close up of the foot up there is attached. And caterpillars, mo um, monarch caterpillars constantly have this little webbing that they're, uh, they use to hold themselves on leaves. And you'll be able to see how he's bringing his little foot out and he is looking for where the J and the way, where the caterpillar skin was attached. So he is going to find that little webby spot. And believe me, this web is really strong. I mean, these guys could withstand a hurricane and uh, not blow off the leaf. So we're gonna watch this while he's still trying to find the webby spot. And... Ha! Huh. Has he got it? Yes. Now, all that black stuff, you can see the antennas hanging down. All of that is skin and uh, stuff that um, the chrysalis is done with. And right now the chrysalis does not look like the picture that we showed you, all smooth and green. But as it hardens up, it will shrink up, shorten up, and uh, look like the chrysalis picture that we showed you. But this is basically looks like an alien organism right now, which uh, certainly is interesting. <clears throat> but 
but there's just a lot of writhing around for this guy to do before he uh, gets that skin sloughed off. Okay, he is still working. Oops, skin is uh, getting ready to drop. But look at that little foot and how beautifully that attaches with all of that action and motion. And I have yet to ever see a chrysalis not stay attached. Okay, there he is. Now it just is up to him to uh, shorten up. And you see how you see these unusual ridges uh, going up. But then it'll turn to that solid green. The gold line gets on there and uh, the little yellow, uh, the little gold dots uh, for, for the breathing. So this guy's winding it up here. Now our next clip will be about, let's see the butterfly come out. And here you can see we've got lots of chrysalises. All right. Butterfly number one is ready to come out. And this happens so fast. And you'll see that the other one's shaking. You know, that one's certainly working on it. I have no idea what they're doing, but it involves plumping up. Now when this guy comes out, look at how short and tiny those wings are. What kind of a miracle is this? And you see how fat the body is. It's a little shadowed there, but that body has all of the fluids he needs to make those wings huge and look like they're supposed to. And you'll see there's a lot of mouth ac action here. And the legs are very stickery. When we go to take out butterflies and if a little kid says that he wants to uh, help get the butterfly out of the can, I always say, now the legs are going to be a little stickery. Is that okay? And depending on the answer, we let the kid help get the monarch out of the can and, and let the butterfly climb up his arm. But those feet are very prickly. All of that juice that's in the body, that will all be pumped into the wings. Bigger, bigger. And what he's hanging on is the chrysalis skin. And look at how thin that membrane is. Again, this is all so thin and so fraught with uh, the possibility for an error somewhere. I mean, when something's that thin, you think, well, what if they split it too soon or whatever? But, But there'll be a lot of twisting and turning and uh, working of the mouth parts, too. I, I don't have any idea what that all means, but apparently it's crucial in the process of the plumping up. We'll just watch for a bit. And here is monarch number two. Now, when I first saw this guy come out and saw how huge his body was, I thought, well, maybe, and his wings seemed a little small, and I thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with him, and he's not going to be successful. But um, I'm happy to tell you that uh, you will get to see him be successful. Notice the juice that uh, they also squirt ju extra juice that apparently is left over out of their body, and it's orange. Go figure. Here's a good shot that shows the chrysalis hanging there, how perfect that thing is, and they just get a little split going in there, and bang, they are out of there. It was really hard to get the movies of this because you would just see a little wiggling and think, oh, we'll get set up here, and then it was... He was already out. But this guy has a really big body. And as you can tell, we have many more to go.
that other little black thing that's there on the ground next to the left of the glass, that is uh, just a leftover piece from when one of the caterpillars went into the chrysalis. And that's just the uh, skin and the antenna and so forth, at, you know, as it dropped off once he got the chrysalis attached. And that just sloughs off. Okay, that pretty much does it, and you have had a very intimate and personal view of the monarch becoming a mature butterfly. Now, a lot of people think that the only milkweed we have in Illinois that's good for monarchs is the common milkweed, the Asclepias syriaca. That is totally not true. Now, I've shown you a lot of common milkweed and the pods, and the very interesting milkweed beetles that love to eat that milkweed. It's the only plant you'll ever find those very colorful guys on. And I'm going to show you pods in fluff. But a great plant is swamp milkweed. This is Asclepius incarnata. And this one is starting to fade, but it is pale pink. Now a variation on this is called Ice Ballet and it is white. The ice ballet is uh, some, some kind of cultivar or a hybrid plant, but it turns out, oh, the monarch caterpillars like it just as much as they do the native prairie plant, the swamp milkweed. So let's look at another one. Now, this is butterfly weed. Uh, this is uh, Asclepius tuberosa. It has a taproot, never travels by uh, roots, not invasive at all. This one, I don't know that the uh, uh, monarchs like it quite as well because it's sort of a leathery leaf and a little thicker, but I have found, uh, certainly found caterpillars on this plant as well. Now I'm going to show you another one, a brand new uh, one that comes from the East Coast. It's a native plant, but it is hello yellow. It's bright yellow. Let's go look at that. Now, this is the other Asclepius tuberosa, hello yellow, fabulous bright yellow color. And this year, for whatever reasons, mine's flopping over, which it doesn't normally do. But you'll see that it's got a pretty thick uh, leathery leaf. So I don't know if uh, what caterpillars think of that. I haven't really done any studies about that. But you'll notice that right behind it here is another tuberosa. But this one seems a little different. Can't explain it, a little compact. Uh, but a little bit darker orange, and oh my goodness, I am not setting these guys up. Better than that, there's another one. They're everywhere. Now this is a milkweed that's a little bit different looking. Uh, doesn't have wide leaves. This is a thin-leafed milkweed, and I'm, I think I personally now am up to about, uh, I think something like 14 different milkweeds, but a bunch of them I planted this year, so they're not in bloom yet this year. But there's a green milkweed, there's a dark purple one, there's one called Sullivan's, but again, the white one with the little thin leaves, very interesting looking plant and, and very attractive. Okay, here I am showing you a bush that all butterflies, not just monarchs, all butterflies love for nectar. This is a non-native bush, it's a budlia, and called, uh, no surprise there, called butterfly bush. And it, um, uh, so it's good for them for food, but no butterfly lays its eggs on it. So when you're at a nursery and you say, oh, I need plants for butterflies, they'll sell you this, but yet what they aren't selling you is the specific one that is the best one for monarchs, which we now know is the milkweed, but this is a great plant to have in your yard. By the way, a lot of people have trouble with this. It dies after the first year. I always throw a bunch of chopped leaves into it in the fall and never cut the stems until spring. I just wanted to give you a close up of what the white swamp milkweed looks like because it's very pretty and it, oh boy, look who's here having a fine little lunch. I have to tell you, this year, the monarchs and the caterpillars are everywhere, 
And this started, all started from me releasing two monarch butterflies. The first ones I had this spring. And since then we've had millions, well, not millions, but lots of caterpillars. This also shows you aphids. Uh, they come on the plant. They're no big deal about them. You wipe them off with your hand, preferably when you have a glove on, uh, so they're not quite so mushy, and uh, they're gone. Remember, no spraying. Now, all the plants I've shown you up to this point have been perennials and non-invasive except for common milkweed. They aren't going to move, but this is tropical milkweed. That means it's an annual. Very good looking, much brighter color, pretty plant. I've got a couple other tropical milkweeds to show you. Here is another annual or tropical milkweed, and it's called Hairy Balls. And it, I think, something to do with the pods. And uh, I believe it will get white flowers. But as you can see, this is a big guy. Uh, this is another interesting tropical milkweed. And I don't know if it has an in individual name, but it is yellow as you see, and um, very good looking plant. And its leaves, you know, one of the tests is if it's a milkweed, is if it's gonna get this white sap. All of them have this white latexy stuff. Uh, Indian for folklore tells us that if you put this on planter's warts, they will disappear. I've had one success story, one that didn't work. So if you need it, try it yourself. Okay, here we see tropical annual milkweed again. This one is a solid orange. This is the Mexican milkweed uh, with the two pretty, you know, real dark orange and the medium orange. Now here is a clue when you're looking for caterpillars. Remember, the egg is stuck underneath the leaf. All eggs are under the leaf. So you're gonna look under the leaf and that's where you're going to find it. And when you see little eaten spots like this, Take a peek, see who you find. Hmm, not seeing anybody today. He's probably moved to another part of the plant. Now what you're looking at is my back 40. And I have every plant, every flower in here is for wildlife. So if it's not for butterflies, it's for hummingbirds, or it might be a host plant, like milkweed is for monarchs, might be a host plant for a different butterfly. But what you want to have are perennials that bloom constantly. I see a monarch sailing through. I'm sure there are lots of bumblebees out there. But this is the look you want. This is a close-up of the same. Now there's a monarch off to the left. Whoops, he disappeared. But monarchs just love flat-faced flowers, like the sunflower, like the Joe Pieweed, like the black-eyed Susans, the phlox. They'll even try and get into hosta flowers, the real fragrant August lily. Well, here you're seeing just another mixed perennial bed that uh, monarchs would like for nectaring. And just to name a couple of plants in the foreground, you're seeing winter hardy hibiscus. This comes in dark pink always with the dinner size blossoms. Behind it, the dark pink is bee balm. That comes in a whole bunch of different colors these days, as well as the uh, native plant la that comes in lavender. You're seeing my grandmother's phlox in the foreground. Daylilies are about finished. Um, you'll see some Joe pie weed. There's some Jerusalem artichoke in the background. Blue lobelia, that's more for hummingbirds. But you'll see a lot of bee action in the flocks. Uh, so all of this is good for all pollinators, including monarchs. Now the program that I've designed is, has several aspects to it. The first one is, tell your neighbors. Tell your neighbors that monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweeds. That's so important. Next thing is, make sure the people in your garden club or your women's club, or your lion's club, or whoever it is, your church group, that they are planting milkweeds and planting milkweed seed. Oh, what's the next aspect of my Milkweed for Monarchs program? Get seed. How are we going to find milkweed seed? Well, you probably don't know, milkweed seed is very expensive. Nobody grows it. How are we going to get it? Well, you're going to get it from me and get three kinds 
different kinds of milkweed seed from me. So, K. McNeil, stamped, self-addressed, business size, business sized envelope, and I will send you swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, and common milkweed samples. Oh, and I love lots of literature. So you'll be getting a lot of that too. So, you've got the seed, you're gonna call your nur local nurseries, you're going to find plants. You wanna have plants, you wanna have seed. Okay, so that covers that. So what's the next aspect? Okay, once you have passed out all this information to your garden club or whoever it is and your friends, you are going to this fall, and whatever fall that may be of whatever year, this fall, you are going to save milkweed seed for me. Wow, what does that mean? You are going to go out and look for milkweed, find it, pull the pods off. Oh, and could you possibly clean it do you remember when you were a kid and you pulled the milkweed fluff out of the pods and it floated off and it was so adorable, the seeds are hanging to their little parachutes? Oh, if you are cleaning this, and specifically, if I am cleaning this alone in my garage, think furry eyeballs, furry lungs, no. I need a little help with the cleaning. Now, all of the seed that you can get for me cleaned, send it to me, and I will get it to IDOT. I will get it hopefully to the toll roads. IDOT has said they will use as much seed as we can give them. School projects, they are always asking me for seed. Townships, highway commissioners, all of these people across Illinois are interested in getting free milkweed seed. So what you're going to do, find milkweed, find it in your yard, plant the plants, and clean the seed, mark it as to variety then you're going to mail it to me. I am hoping to fill burlap bags of milkweed seed this fall. We want to give all of these agencies more milkweed seed than they have ever seen. Oh, and how does this vision end? It ends with the return of monarchs and Illinois can become as famous for its native plants and its gorgeous prairie uh, plant roadsides as Lady Bird, exactly what Lady Bird Johnson did for Texas and the Blue Bonnets. I believe in Texas they have uh, little things online that tell a schedule as to when the Blue Bonnets are in bloom throughout the state. Why aren't we aspiring to that here in Illinois? When is the milkweed in bloom? We've got a state that's long enough, starts at Southern Illinois, comes all the way up to North Chicago. And people will come as tourists and will want to see that. Wouldn't we want to see prairie plants in the prairie state? Sure you do. Anyway, that's my program and that's what I'm trying to achieve. All of this is on a shoestring budget. I don't have uh, any finances for this. And when I first started talking about doing this, the one thing that came to mind was, would I be filling up little earring Ziplocs with milkweed seed night after night into, into past midnight and into one, two o'clock? Well, that was my vision. Ha, huh, but I found a new friend, Ward Johnson of Save Our Monarchs. And you should be seeing his website go across the bottom. You'll see it again at the end. Save Our Monarchs comes from Minnesota. Their only objective is to get hundreds of thousands, and now his, he aspires to millions of these swamp milkweed. That's a, oh, dig the Latin, Asclepius incarnata, not invasive, swamp milkweed into the hands of gardeners. He is a not-for-profit, and his only objective is to get milkweed into the hands of gardeners. You want to look at his website. So, I buy seeds from Ward Johnson. This, I can buy 100 packets of these for 25 bucks, and I can sell them to you for that, because there's no profit made by anybody, and uh, seven bucks postage. So, these people save me a lot of time and a lot of money, and now I get some sleep too, and don't have to worry about how I'm packing up uh, little, little packets of seed. So, three samples of milkweed seed. Did I say they will be common milkweed? Now, common milkweed seed, that's the invasive one. That is the Sclepia syriaca, and that one is the one you want to eyeball a two-lane highway that's not too well cut, and then you will take your pod down the dark road in the middle of the night, sit in the back seat, hold your pod out the window, 
and let it fly and you will be propagating. Basically, you'll become the Johnny Appleseed of the milkweed world. So that is common milkweed. I send you a little sample of that. That you put someplace where you don't want to have, uh, where you have a wild area and, and you don't care how much of it comes up. The other two kinds I send you are Asclepius incarnata, which is the swamp milkweed from Ward Johnson in this very pretty little packet. By the way, good for weddings, good for Christmas cards. Oh, don't you want your cousins to know about this? Of course you do. Put this in the, in the holiday card. Um, and the third kind of seed that I send you is Asclepius tuberosa, orange butterfly weed. I realize it has that bad W-E-E-D in the name, but can't be helped. This has the taproot like a carrot. Neither swamp milkweed or butterfly weed are moving at all by uh, uh, any kind of roots. They are self-contained, they are perennial. Oh, you don't have to keep replanting them. I have both of those plants right outside my front door in my front perennial bed, beautifully mannered. Well, friends, now you know a whole lot about monarchs, and, and you may be saying by this time, that's more than I wanted to know about monarchs. But I've shown you the plants, I've shown you how to raise out caterpillars, but wait, there's one more thing. I have to tell you a quick story. When I was a kid, it was time to go back to school, and you're going to have your physical and all of that, and I had terrible rash up and down my arms. Well, the doctor my mother took me to, very, very smart man. He says to me, do you like caterpillars? I replied, of course. Well, yes, I do. And this is in the olden days when we had furry caterpillars everywhere. Well, he says, do you keep those in a box? And I said, oh, yes, I do. And, and he said, do you take them out and uh, uh, let them crawl up and down your arms? Well, of course I did. He says, there's the trouble. I don't know if you're allergic to the fur on the caterpillars or their little feet or whatever it is, but I think if you quit doing that, you won't have any more rash. Well, I don't know what that means, but anyway, good luck, good monarching, and have fun with this. And I remember, I'm only a phone call or an email away. I'd like you to keep watching because I've got some great butterfly guard plant lists for you and some milkweed plant lists. And all of these plants you'll be able to find at a local garden center or online. And I think this will help you get your butterfly garden pulled together.